Amen. If you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to open to the book of Genesis chapter 41. We are continuing our series, Lessons from the Life of Joseph. We're only going to read a few verses out of this chapter, but I would like to encourage you uh, this morning to maybe uh, later on today, take the time to just read through. You know the word peruse means to read slowly and carefully? It does not mean to skim. So I'm going to encourage you to peruse in the technical sense of perusing. Just take your time and read through Genesis chapter 41, and I think it will enrich and confirm and clarify things that we talk about this morning. And so we're going to look at Genesis 41, verses 14 through 16, and verses 38 through 41. So Genesis 41, 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now let's go down to verse 38. Joseph has done his interpreting and it says, um, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find anyone else like this? One in whom is the spirit of God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. And here's our key text. You shall be over my house. Everybody say, over my house. Mm. And all my people shall order themselves as you command. Say, as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land. Say, all the land of Egypt. This is about the power test. We've been looking at several tests from the life of Joseph. We talked about the prison test last week, the prophetic test. And this morning, we're going to look at the power test test. Now, has anybody heard of a guy named Plato? Wave your hand at me if you've heard of Plato. Okay, about two-thirds of you have heard of Plato. Plato is perhaps the most famous Greek philosopher to ever live. A lot of what we think and understand about reality is shaped deeply by Plato. Plato said this. He said, the measure of a man is what he does with power. The measure of a man is what he does with power. Lord Acton, a British aristocrat, said this, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Public enemy said, Fight the power. But they were just quoting the Isley Brothers, so that's okay. (laughs) Y'all didn't think I knew about all that. Fight the power. (sighs) Hmm. So this morning, we're going to look at four fundamental questions related to power. Because, and this is very important, you and I live in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And some people hear that and they go, that's right, pastor. Other people hear that and they go, ooh. Really? Still? Or is that a good thing? Have you ever noticed that there's a lot of conflict in the United States right now? We can't figure out what we're supposed to do in terms of Ukraine. We can't figure out what we're supposed to do in terms of Israel and Gaza. And some of us are wondering where all the billions of dollars are coming from that are going out of the country. 
And the fact is, I'm not going there so everybody can take a deep exhale right now. We're not going into politics as much as to say, with great power, here comes Spider-Man comes great responsibility and you want to walk around like you're the most powerful dog on the block when there's trouble on the block everybody comes looking to you so it kind of begs our first question and here it is what is power power is the ability to do things We can just stop it there. It's the ability to do things. And it's by virtue of strength, skill, resources, or authority. If that definition frustrates you, it's because it's a pretty good definition. And here's what I mean. It's it's not original to me, so that's why I'm saying it. Don't worry, I'm not bragging here. I'm simply saying this. It's ethically vague because it doesn't say what kind of things you're able to do. It simply says you're able to do things. For instance, in the Gospels, Jesus spoke of, and I quote, the power of God and the power of darkness. In America... A lot of us, not all of us, we're prone to hear the word power in a positive light because we live in a powerful country. If you were the citizen of a country that was stricken with poverty and violence and was powerless to help itself, you might think of power in a negative light because you're the victim listen to me, of somebody else's ability to do things. Pardon me for being extreme, but I'm going to go there for this purpose to make the point. A rapist has power. He's able to do something. And unfortunately, his victim is not able to stop him. And at that point, we clearly understand that power, this is important, is not inherently good or evil. It's simply ability. What makes power good or evil is its connection. We'll go into grammar class right now, right? Prepositions. Prepositions in the English language include this word of. Of is a preposition. So when Jesus says the power of God, he's talking about power that is connected to, belongs to, or expressed by God. Power of darkness is all of the same things, but in relation to a context that is opposed to God. So when we say, God, send your power, or God, I want to walk in power, of course, the question is, what do you mean when you say power? There is a tendency for us to conflate or confuse the reality that is power with control. Please write these words down if you're taking notes. Do not confuse power with control. Can I say something that might... I will. I don't know why I'm asking. I'll say something that might offend you or bother you. If you don't like it, I'll keep moving on. It's okay. God is not in control. I knew he was a heretic. God is not in control. God is powerful. But if you equate power with control, you will say things like God is in control. Control 
is the direction that comes without interference over a particular event. So for instance, you control your car by virtue of a steering wheel. Let's go back to the hypothetical instance of what I mentioned before regarding rape. Let's go back to what I mentioned before that regarding Ukraine. Do we want to say God is in control, meaning that God is directly causing a rapist to do what he does or Vladimir Putin to do what he's doing? Do we want to say that God is controlling that? I don't think we want to say that. Well, then, if God's not in control, then what? God is powerful. More specifically, we want to say it this way. God is sovereign. God sits on a throne fully empowered, but in that power, he does not have the need to control. We don't have time to go there, but I'll simply say this. The temptation in Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent approaches Eve is a temptation for control. Power out of context. You can be as God without being connected to God. That's the original temptation. There are two words among many that are biblical words for power. And they can be helpful for us when we're reading the Bible to try to get a biblical or hopefully Christianly sense of what power is. So the first one we want to look at is a Hebrew word for power. And it's very easy. It's Oz, like the wizard of Oz, O-Z, that's the word. Dr. Oz is Dr. Power. Just think of it that way. It is a Hebrew word referring to the strength of God, specifically God bestowing his strength on man. We see it in 1 Samuel 2.10 with the king. God bestows his strength on his people. We see that in Psalm 29, 11. We see God bestowing his strength on Zion, Isaiah 52, verse 1. But not only is strength a quality given by God, he himself is that strength. So again, when we think of our definition of power, it is the ability to do a thing. When we think of the word ability, think of it in the context of strength to do a thing. God is the very power. So God, power in the kingdom of God, in this case, is a lot like grace. And that is, it's not a thing. Power is not a spiritual commodity. Say, here we go. God, give me your power. And God says, here's power. I have so many bottles of power. I'm going to give you a bottle of power. That is not biblical power, and that is not biblical grace. Power and grace is if God could take a part of himself, off of himself, and hand it to you. Power is God himself. Grace is God's self being extended to you. It's deeply personal, and therefore, listen to me, the essence of God's power is the essence of God's character. What this means is that God's power cannot be at odds with God's love, cannot be at odds with God's mercy, cannot be at odds with God's holiness, can be at, cannot be at odds with God's justice. Because power is not one in a series of things that God has back in the closet that he can go and get it for you. It's God giving you a measure of himself. That's the biblical understanding. When we read the Hebrew Bible and it talks about God's power, it talks about his Oz. It's talking about the strength of God that is God that he shares with his people. The New Testament, of course, was written in Greek, and there are several Greek words for power, but the one we're going to look at today is exousia. Exousia. That is a word which speaks about the power or the ability to do something, but listen to this. It can also describe the right to exercise authority or rule. So exousia expands the meaning 
It's sort of like the difference between a gun and a badge. Hello. Anybody can get a gun, but not everybody can get a badge. Exousia is the bringing together of the gun and the badge. It's the strength matched with the authority. Okay, so let's go to the second question. The second question is, where does power originate? I want you to open your Bible to Psalm 62. Psalm 62, we're just going to look at two verses, uh, three verses, 10 through 12. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes in, on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. Power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. For you repay to all according to their work. The first thing we want to point out here is notice God says one thing, but two things are heard. The two things that are heard are power and love. In other words, they are not separable. They're not distinct. They're caught up in the same word. And of course, the one word that God has spoken is the logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God spoke one word, the only word begotten of the Father, Jesus, and in him we see power and love. Now, what's interesting here is this psalm is a psalm of encouragement to people who are oppressed and haven't seen their breakthrough yet. If you look at the beginning of the psalm, you'll see a phrase in verse 3, how long? Has anybody ever prayed that prayer to God? How long? How about verse 5, my soul waits in silence. In other words, I'm just out of stuff to say right now. I'm just sitting here because you haven't come through yet, God. And that's what leads to verse 10. Verse 10 is saying, don't try to assert or grab at power through money. Don't think if I can just get the loan, if I can just get the mortgage, if I can just get another credit card, if I can convince my boss to give me a raise, if I can convince that boss to give me a job, or God forbid you're extorting people. We don't want to go there. Uh, Either way, this is an attempt to, when you talk about extortion, it's actually in the Hebrew talking about the oppression, violence, and force. He's saying, don't try to fix it by asserting your strength. Don't try to do that. That's an attempt to gain control of your life. We don't need to control our lives. We need to surrender our lives, not to the God who's in control, but to the God of all power who is sovereign and sits upon a throne. What we get from this text, where does power originate? All power, all power originates with God. There is no power apart from God, which means even bad applications and expressions of power come from God. In other words, God shares his power. All power is derivative. What we do not want to do is suggest for a moment that someone has power apart from God because then we create a whole new world of trouble. What does it say in the book of Romans, chapter 13? It says that God has given power. He has given military, physical, corporal power, the sword, to the government. How do they use that? Don't answer that question. It's rhetorical. You realize there's more than one government, right? How throughout history have the governments of the world used the power that God has given them? Do we want to say that somehow they got it on their own apart from God? God is not threatened by anybody else's power because they didn't come up with it on their own in the first place. Cyril of Alexander, who's one of the church fathers, said it this way. He said, every created being whatsoever is endued with power. 
I came here this morning to tell you, you may not feel like it, you may not look like it, but you have been endued with power by virtue of existing. Why? Because you're an image bearer. God has given you, this is the word we would use in theology, he has given you agency. Okay? He, Cyril says, every created being whatsoever that is endued with power, look at this, possesses it not of itself, but as a thing given it by God. For to the creature, all things are given and wrought in it, and of itself, the creature can do nothing. Power comes from God. We see this most clearly Turn with me. This is an important verse for us. John 19. John 19 is the scene in which Jesus is brought before Pilate. Pilate has sent him to Herod, hoping that Herod will handle the political mess that's in front of him. And Herod looks at it and says, I don't want anything to do with this. So Herod sends him back to Pilate. And in John chapter 19 and verse 10, this is what we read. Pilate says to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have, what's that word? Power to release you and power to crucify you. And what does Jesus say? You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Did Pilate have power? Yes, he did. What did Jesus say? You wouldn't have the power you do. Read the text closely. Pilate says, I've got the power to let you go, and I've got the power to execute you. And Jesus says, that's fair. Where did you get it? And this, when we say this, we must be careful right here. And I must stop myself in this moment at this text. And I must gather myself to understand this is the deepest of mysteries the world will ever encounter. That the worst crime humanity could ever commit, we would read from the apostles in the book of Acts, happens according to the exact foreknowledge of God and will of God. This is why we say God is not in control, but he is sovereign. The fact is, unlike Pilate, if we are followers of Jesus who have been baptized into his body, we are not agents of empire. We are representatives of the King of Kings. We don't walk through life conformed to this world. We walk through life renewed by the transforming power of God in us. That's how we live our lives. The enemy tempts people with carnal power, with lust for control, trying to determine the outcomes of their lives and the lives around them. That's what the offer is. That's why people go into everything from politics to policing and you name it. We think if we can control the situation, we'll be satisfied. Control will never satisfy. This leads to a third question. Who receives power? And by implication, it's who receives power in God's kingdom? Well, the first answer to that is quite simple. The humble receive power in God's kingdom. You might remember a verse in James chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of God and he will exalt you. He will give you power at the right time. Understand this. You play a direct role in your own humility. Humility is something we take responsibility for. We don't look at God and say, just Slip me some of that. Humility comes when we have an opportunity to exercise control, but rather die to self. Humility is when I'm able to do a thing, but I don't do it because I prefer my brother or my sister. 
And that thing usually has to do with language. I'm not going to say what I want to say right now. Even though I'm able and I have the strength to say it, I'm going to swallow those words. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. And here's the thing. The humble soul is a content soul. Because a humble soul is a grateful soul. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Very much an echo of what James was saying. The apostle Peter says this. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And I love this phrase. All of you, young and old alike, must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Now, the message, which I think was just on the screen, you just kind of stole my punchline there. Here we go. But all of you, leaders and followers alike, pulpit and the pew, be down to earth with each other. Why? God has had it with the proud but takes delight in just plain people. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you and he'll promote you, let's, let's say empower you at the right time. And, and that right time is the key. Because the humble soul is the content soul is the patient soul. You can reverse engineer that. Those of us who aren't patient, it's because we're not content. If we're not content, it's because we're of the opinion that things should be happening at a different rate. That exalted opinion reveals a lack of humility. The humble soul is the content soul is the patient soul. The patient soul is the soul who waits well. What happens? Acts chapter 1, Jesus says this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's another Greek word, dunamis. You shall receive power. And then what does he say? Wait in Jerusalem. Waiting is that ability to stay in the moment so that you can be present to the power. How many of us have missed out on God's best for us because we did not have the patience that flows out of contentment that is the fruit of our humility, but we thought we knew. Here's our fourth, fourth question. Why does God give us power? I know why I want power. <laughs> I love control. Let's make it practical. Let's get away from the dark and the disturbed and the very, you know, abstract ideas. How about traffic? Does anybody wish you had the power to create your very own lane on every road you drove on? so that you could leave whenever you wanted to leave and know for certain you would arrive at your intended time. Does that sound like good power to you? Sounds so good to me. I dream of being on the Autobahn one day when I can get in that left lane and there is no speed limit and the cops will arrest you if you're in the lane going too slow. That's the nation I want to live in. Where I'm coming up on you at 150 miles an hour and I can flash my high beams and you know you better get over. The cop's going to bust you. That's, that's the way God intended the, word to, the, word, the road to operate. That's control. And when we don't have it, it brings out the most colorful language in our cars, doesn't it? 
It's not just us. You might remember there are two brothers. They're known as the sons of thunder, actually. They're quite fiery guys, these two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And they are with Jesus uh, in Mark chapter 10. It's a very sacred moment, the week of God's passion, where Jesus is getting ready uh, to surrender his life uh, on the cross. And it says in Mark 10, 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said, teach Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Has anybody ever prayed that prayer? You know you have. You know you have. We've all prayed that prayer. We're just not as honest as they are. I'm believing. I'm expecting. I'm touching and agreeing. You better do it. And so Jesus will ask this question. And remember this. God never asks a question because he lacks information. God will always ask a question because he wants to provide revelation to ourselves about ourselves. So Jesus, rather than saying, you idiots, how are you glad God doesn't always talk to you? He talks to me that way a lot, but he doesn't. God just has a way. And what does Jesus say? What is it you want me to do for you? Give us power. What do they say? They say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptize, baptism that I am baptized with? What is that cup? It's the cup that Jesus in the garden said, if there's any way, let it pass from me. It's the cup that the psalmist and the prophet spoke of, the cup of God's wrath that is foaming and overflowing because of the transgressions of humanity that Jesus would drink to the dregs. That cup, he says, you want power in my kingdom? The humble one, the content one, the surrendered one, the patient one, the one who drinks the cup is the one who gets the power. Why? Because God's power is not for our gratification. It is for others' good. In Acts 10, the apostles are speaking about Jesus. And in Acts 10, 37 and 38, listen to this description that they give us of him. The gospel message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Everybody say it out with. How he went about doing good. We want the spirit and we want the power, but are we ready and prepared and committed to do good? And what was it? Healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God's power is shared with his people so we can turn around and bless others. We can bring liberty to captives. We can bring hope to those who are sitting in darkness. That is why he gives us power for healing, for deliverance, for enlightenment. This is why he gives us power for cups of cold water, for plates of hot food, for blankets when people are cold. This is why he gives us power. He does not give us power so we can sit in church and say, look how powerful we are. The fact is God's people always have a complicated relationship with power. Joseph had a complicated relationship with power. He got power. We read about it this morning. We even highlighted the phrases, over all my house, over all the land. Everybody will answer to you. The only person that won't answer to you is me. What does Joseph do with his power? You can turn there if you want, but Genesis 47 is one of the most unsettling chapters in the back part of the book of Genesis. Genesis 47, the famine continues. 
we remember the story. We remember Pharaoh's dreams. Seven fat cows, seven thin cows. What did it mean? Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. What are we going to do during the seven years of plenty? We're going to store up grain. Seven years of famine is a long time. And apparently over the course of that, we read that uh, the Egyptians kept coming back to Pharaoh to get food. But they weren't talking to Pharaoh. Who were they talking to? They're talking to Joseph because Joseph has power. And what does Joseph do with his power? In verse 14 of chapter 47, he took everyone's money. Uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, let's, let's read it so you don't believe, just assume I'm just saying it. Joseph collected how much of the money? All the money in exchange for the grain. He didn't stop there. Verse 16, he took all their equipment, all their livestock, all their money-making potential. He emptied their bank accounts in 14 and he emptied their garage in 16. What does it say? Joseph said, give me your livestock and I will give you food if your money's gone. Oh boy. Do you think Joseph is increasing in popularity at this point? It gets worse. Verse 20. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. All the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe upon them and the land became Pharaoh's. Look at this. As for the people, he made slaves of them. From one end of Egypt to the other. This bothered me, I'm not going to lie, because when I read the Bible, I'm always looking for Jesus. I think there's a way we can read the story of Joseph and see ourselves, because we all have those sort of moments where we've been betrayed like Joseph. We all have those seasons where we feel like we're in a pit, we feel like we're in a prison. Some of us have met Potiphar's wife, right? We, we, have, we, we have our Joseph stories, but here's the thing, the Bible's not about me. The Bible's about Jesus. The rabbis have taught for centuries that the Torah was written for the sake of the Messiah. Why is that Christians have turned it into a book about me and how I can make my life better? The Bible is about Jesus. When I see Joseph, I got to see Jesus. When I see Joseph, I have to see Jesus being betrayed by his brethren. When I see Joseph, I have to see Jesus not maybe in a pit, but maybe he's before Pilate. Maybe instead of being lied upon, lied upon by Potiphar's wife, maybe Jesus is being lied upon by Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes who are saying he did this and he said that and none of it's true, but he's going to face the consequences anyway. Maybe when I look at Joseph, I can start seeing Jesus, but I got into a problem right here. Jesus taking everybody's money. Jesus taking every... I see Jesus being humble and being exalted. Glory to God. I see the one who was willing, according to Philippians chapter 2, to empty himself, not considering equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbling himself in obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. I see that when I see Joseph standing in Pharaoh's court. I see the one, Isaiah 53 says, they looked upon him and they esteemed him not smitten. And here he stands in glory. I see coming out of a prison like a coming out of a tomb. I see Jesus when I see Joseph. But when I get to Genesis 47, I have a problem. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit started speaking to me. The Egyptians were starving in a famine, and they went to Joseph. But weren't all of us starving in sin? Proverbs 13, 25 says, The righteous have enough to satisfy their appetite, but the belly of the wicked is empty. 
There's something about living in wickedness and transgression that creates a longing in the human heart. There's a phrase that's been bouncing around the Christian church literally for centuries, and it says this. It says, every man who knocks on the door of the brothel is looking for God. I don't sin because I love sin. I sin because I'm looking to love God. Think about it. When God shows up in fullness upon the 120 in the upper room, what does everybody think they are? Drunk. Fullness of joy. If I'm not getting it, from, if I'm not getting new wine of the Holy Ghost from the Heavenly Father, I might just go down the street and try to get a case there. There is a famine in our souls because of sin. And when we come to Jesus, you know what he asks for? Everything. Joseph made them slaves of Pharaoh, and Jesus makes us slaves of righteousness. Romans 6 and verse 16, 17, 18. Joseph walked in Pharaoh's power. Jesus walks in the power of the Father, saying, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And the most clear demonstration of the power of God is at the cross. Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 18, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is why Jesus is willing to talk about power, power with Pilate. Because in that moment, Pilate's talking about the power he's got. And Jesus is saying, you don't know anything about power. You're looking at power right now. I could call 12 legions of angels from heaven. And I'm not calling it, not because I'm weak, but because I'm strong. Not because I'm not able, but because I am able. And I choose to love you enough to let this happen. You're looking at power, not when I do something, but when I don't do something. That's the kingdom of God. This is the power of God, the cross of Jesus Christ. I didn't have to, but I did. That's the power of God. And when I look at Joseph making slaves of everybody, oh, that's so horrible. Yeah, it might have been, but you know what? There's one coming, the true and better Joseph, who's going to demand everything of us. And when we give it to him, he's going to make us slaves of righteousness because he himself is a slave. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. We all know. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was stricken for our illness. And our chastisement rest upon him. Our English translations refer to it as the suffering servant. The Hebrew eved is the suffering slave. Jesus says, I'm a slave. Come join me, and we'll be friends. We'll live in our Father's kingdom. Jesus can share his power with fellow slaves because we know our identity and our freedom is in him. Only in the kingdom of, a God, of God like this, this God of Jesus, only in this kingdom could we be the sort of people who only find freedom through slavery. Only find power in yielding up our desire for control. Only find exaltation as we humble ourselves. This is the upside down kingdom of God. He shares his power with us because we are slaves. We are joint heirs with the slave of heaven. We are free from sin. Bob Dylan said it this way. We start with public enemy, we end with Bob Dylan. You're going to have to serve somebody. 
You're going to be a slave of somebody because you're a creature. I'm a creature. We're creaturely beings. The lie is that you can be God. We can lay aside the sin and the weight that holds us back. We are called to a destiny that involves us being conformed to the image of a king who himself is a slave. And we are empowered to the extent that we share his spirit, we share his essence, and we live as his representatives in the earth, bringing power to a starving world. And so we conclude with a meal. Christian worship has been centered on a meal for 2,000 years. We should get to every Sunday starving for the body and blood of Jesus. What does Jesus say? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. We come to this meal this morning with great expectation and great hope. We're free from sin, but we can't say we're not affected by it. That's why Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who is going to free me from this body of sin? If you got a body, you're feeling the effects of it. And we come to this body and this blood every Sunday to remind ourselves that there is freedom, there is hope, there's something coming greater than this moment. And so I'm going to ask the ushers if they would help me out right now and distribute. If you haven't picked one up, make sure that you get one. You can raise your hands and they'll make sure that you have a, uh, a cup and a wafer. I'm going to do a little prep here. 